Thank you, Dr. Spears. Um, if you had ever seen me dance, you would know that I would never be the president of uh, anything having to do with that. There's a reason that Biola abolished dancing some years ago, <laughs> and you're looking at him. <clears throat> it is an offense against the good, the true, and the beautiful. <laughs> well, many thanks uh, to the Tory faculty and, and uh, you esteemed people of this very esteemed community for uh, allowing me the opportunity to be here with you. I, I count it a pleasure and a privilege. Um, I'm on sabbatical this semester, and so I've missed uh, the, the kind of energy and excitement that comes at the beginning of a semester, so it's, uh, it's a, an extra treat for me to be here and to uh, be able to experience some of that with you. And my experience is at the beginning of a semester, we tend to be, have great aspirations and vision, and then by the end of the semester, that has lowered down into a mere uh, search for survival. And about this time in the semester, survival is starting to kind of creep up <laughs> as an option. And so what I'd like to do this, this evening is to remind us why we're here, um, to pull the periscope up a bit before it gets completely buried, and get perspective, a big kind of picture vision of why it is that we are here, um, and how I'm going to suggest a few things about how to spend the time that you do have here with the amazing opportunities uh, that you will have. As the prison warden said to the new inmates who had just arrived, the world will be a better place because you are here. <laughs> now, I'm not a prison warden, and I assume that you're here for other reasons. But I am convinced that the world will be a better place because you are here. Um, you will be in a better place personally. Your family, your friends, your community, the Church of Jesus Christ, the, the mission of the gospel, the world will be a better place because you are here. But of course it depends on what you do with the time that you're here, how you live out the life here that you've been given. And so I, I would like, it's not automatic, and, and so I would like to suggest uh, some perspective on this, some counsel along those lines. And I'd like to illustrate it by telling you the story of two villages about the same time in history, the years of World War II. The first village is in southern Poland. It's called Oświęcim. Oświęcim was just a small farming village. It would never even register a bleep on the, on the radar screen of important places, except for the fact that, that the Nazi army during World War II built a concentration camp at Auschwitz, which they gave the German name Auschwitz. And at Auschwitz and its sister camp Birkenau, the Nazis put to death at least one and a half million innocent people. Now, I used to work in Poland uh, in mission work back behind the Iron Curtain in the late 70s and early 80s. And so I had a chance to, to visit Auschwitz several times. In fact, my wife Debbie and I were there in May of this year. Um, and we hadn't been there for a long time. And some of you may have been there. But as you can imagine, it's a very, very difficult experience. You see the horrific living conditions of these poor people. There are, there are rooms full of artifacts of Auschwitz, things that belonged to the prisoners, to the victims of Auschwitz. There's a, there's a room, for example, full of shoes. Some of them are baby shoes. There's a room full of combs, a room full of eyeglass frames, a room full of hair, human hair, shaved from the bodies. Uh, of the victims before they were incinerated. Most of the hair was sent back to Germany to make blankets and clothing for the, for the war effort. Uh, there's, of course, the showers where the, the people were herded in, and instead of water coming out of the faucets, it was Cyclone B gas, and they were asphyxiated. And then the height of engineering at the time, the ovens, Thousands of bodies a day could be incinerated to remove all 
evidence of their existence. But to me, the most impactful place at Auschwitz was not the room full of hair or even when I didn't mention the room full of teeth with gold and silver extracted to fund the war effort. It, it was not even the ovens. It was the room full of suitcases. Suitcases with the names of the victims painted on them by the victims themselves. None of them very big, but some of them a little bigger, some very small, carried into Auschwitz by people with names created in the image of God, handing a guard all that they possess, promise that they will get this back when their work there is done. Moms and dads, boys and girls, babies, aunts and uncles, grandparents, friends, neighbors, all created in the image of God, each one with a name. The second or third time I was there, uh, my wife Debbie pointed out to me a suitcase that I hadn't noticed. In the middle, about half of the way up, was a suitcase with the name Eva Horner on it. Her last name the same as mine. And all of a sudden, Auschwitz became very personal to me. Eva Horner was born on June 13th, 1920. I, I learned that from the suitcase. I don't know if she was related to me, but I know that here was, a, here was a young woman about your age who was a victim of Auschwitz. I know her name, I know her birth date, and I know that Eva Horner was the victim of an idea. People think of Auschwitz and a Holocaust as, as a mystery, as, as a kind of absurdity. How could it be that people who are part of the most highly advanced, highly educated, highly cultured uh, nation in the, in the history of the planet at that time, how could they do such things? There's no answer to this. It's a mystery. Well, I don't think it's a mystery at all. I think a biblical understanding of the human heart and human depravity uh, gives us good reason to understand it. But there's another aspect that I am convinced of, and that is that Eva Horner was the victim of an idea. And it was not an idea that began at Auschwitz. It was an idea that captured the minds of leading German intellectuals and scholars and judges and, and, and uh, physicians and psychiatrists and lawyers back in the 1920s and the 30s. In German, it's Lebens und Wertes Leben, a life that is not worthy of life, a life that is not worthy to be lived. The killing did not start in Auschwitz and Birkenau and, and Treblinka. It started in Germany with Germans. In the 20s and the 30s, tens of thousands of ethnic Germans were taken from mental institutions and hospitals and nursing homes and put to death because it was determined that their life was not worthy to be lived. Eventually, they put people to death for such serious things as being chronic bedwetters and having poorly formed ears. Eva Horner was the victim of an idea Auschwitz is not a, a mystery, it's a monument to an idea. I'm sure you've heard it many times. Ideas have consequences. What you believe will determine how you behave and ultimately who you become. This is true for individuals, it's true for families, it's true for institutions, it's true for nations. And because ideas have consequences, our minds matter. It matters how we think about ideas. It, it matters how well we think about them. We need to navigate ideas. We need to think well about them in the marketplace of ideas. Bad ideas, false conceptions of the good, the true, and the beautiful will have terrible consequences ultimately, including Auschwitz. True ideas, accurately getting on to what is in fact the good, the true and the beautiful and lived out will bring good consequences, flourishing, life. The stakes are huge. And so the world will be a better place because you were here, because you are in a place that is uniquely committed to the power of ideas and the importance of thinking well. And uh, I assume that you're here for that reason and not because you're felons. 
I assume that you understand that you could be somewhere else spending a lot less money and it would be a lot easier for you. But you're here because you care about this, at least some. It's hard to imagine a better way of thinking about education than that which informs Tory Honor Institute, Honors Institute, of engaging the most important ideas in the most important texts of all time and being held accountable for thinking well about them by your professors and by your peers. Not everybody thinks that. And I've spent most of my adult life, frankly, trying to convince people that ideas are important and the life of the mind is, is crucially important, often to people who don't really get that picture. I'm not gonna try to make that case in the rest of my remarks this evening. I assume you understand that. But I do want to say that for people like us, people who do care about ideas, it's important that we make sure we pull the periscope up even a little bit further to the very top and see where even the life of the mind and the importance of ideas fits in the ultimate perspective. And we see that perspective in the words of Jesus in Mark 12 that were read for us earlier this evening. The reason this passage is so well known, I think, is because it's about what's most important and what Jesus says is so clear. It's not easy, but it's clear. A scribe, uh, an ideas person, an intellectual, a scholar, somebody that would be, we would be comfortable being with, asked Jesus a very important question. What is the most important commandment? And this was a very technical question because the rabbis had counted 613 commandments in the Old Testament. 365 negative commands, things not to do, and 248 positive commands, things to do, for a total of 613. How many of you can recite the 10 commandments right now? Okay, a few of you. How many of you can recite the 613 commandments? Okay, it's a little tough. I can do it, of course, no. Um, I can dance them. Um, <laughs> most of them are, he are uh, <laughs> the, well, I forget. I'll just, I'll try, to, I'll try to restrain myself here. Okay. So obviously they're not equally important or equally stringent. And so they, they weighted them. Some were heavy, some were light, some were lesser, some were greater. And so this, this scribe is asking a really important question to Jesus. What is the heaviest one? What's the most important one, the greatest commandment? What is the thing that God wants most from me? What's the bottom line? Now, as I mentioned, I'm on sabbatical this semester. We, are, we come up for sabbatical every seven years. So I'm not much for math but I've kind of worked it out and I try to think, okay, how many more sabbaticals do I have in my academic career? And I, I don't think I have more than 10 or 15 more ahead of me. <laughs> Actually, this may be it. This may be it. And so I'm asking the question a lot right now. What's the most important thing that I ought to be about this, this sabbatical? What will make the most difference, what can I do now that will make the most difference in the rest of my life? And I'm thinking about what should I be doing in the rest of my life? How should I go about the calling that God has given me? Now, in case you haven't noticed it, you also are in a very important place in life right now as a university student. You are settling some fundamental issues that will affect the rest of your life who you are, not just who your parents are. The three M's, master, mission, and mate. Those are all hugely important questions for you right now, and I hope that you're asking regularly, you're pulling the periscope up and asking, what's the most important thing? What should I be living for? Will the world be a better place because I'm, I'm here? Now, we all know Jesus' answers to these questions. He appeals to Old Testament passages that his audience knew. Deuteronomy 6.5, love God with all that you are and all that you have and all that you do. Leviticus 19.18, love your neighbor as yourself. He says that 
you know, what's the most important commandment? Well, here are two. Really, they, they go together. They're not the same commandment, but they, but they always go together. The second is like the first. You can't separate them. And that's the perspective, I suggest, that we need to keep in mind. Even those of us who rightly get it about ideas and thinking. These are familiar words, so they're e it's, it's easy to, to lose track of what they mean. At least I have to keep coming back to them, and I am coming back to them during this season of my life. If I identify myself as a follower of Jesus, if he is my Lord, my teacher, my master, my leader, if I am a follower of Jesus and he says, this is the most important thing, then this is the most important thing. And I need to, th part of thinking well for me, right at the center of thinking well for me, has to be thinking about what that means for me, how I live my life because of that. Now, how does what Jesus says relate to what we've already talked about, about the importance of ideas in the, in, the, in the life of the mind? Well, I'll just make three quick observations. Number one, what Jesus is saying is itself an idea, an idea with huge consequences. Jesus is answering the most fundamental philosophical question. What is the good life? What is good? What is most real? What is the summum bonum? What is it that I should live for? What is it that should organize my priorities and my affections? What is it that I should worship? How should I live my life? And Jesus' answer, like other answers that have been given, is an idea, and it's either true or false. And the consequences are so immense about how, how, wh where we settle on this. And so it behooves us to think very, very well indeed. So this is, this is part of the, of the quest for asking, for, for uh, thinking well. A second way that this fits into to the idea of the, the importance of the mind in thinking is that Jesus says, Part of loving God is to love God with all your mind. That's part of what it's about. How do we do that? Well, what are our minds for? They're for thinking, reasoning, creating, imagining, in making inferences. We love God with all our mind by doing all that stuff the best we can for his glory as an expression of loving God. The life of the mind, doing the best with what we've got, whether we are scholars or not, is part of loving God. It's part of what God has called us to do. There is no room for anti-intellectualism in true Christianity. Now again, I think I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, but we have to remember that loving God with our minds is not just that. We heard this earlier this evening from, from a book, the most influ influential book ever written. Today it is the world's bestseller. It is the most censored, the most opposed, the most persecuted book in all of history. And yet today, it, it is the most influential book that has ever been written. It's called the Bible. And it claims to be God's own word, God's speaking. So loving God with our minds, if that's true, then it has to be particularly grounded in what he says in his word. And so I encourage you while you're here at this place that you would not only read great books, you would read the greatest book. That you would take advantage of all the opportunities that you have to be taught from scripture. That you would love God with your minds when you're reading Hesiod. And you would love God with your minds while you're reading his word. But there's a third way that, that what Jesus says impacts the idea of loving, uh, the idea of thinking well. And that's the hardest one for me, and I suspect it may be the hardest one for you. Frankly, I don't have any problem with, with passionately pursuing the life of the mind. That's, that, I love doing that. And in fact, I love 
reading scripture, studying scripture, and I have no difficulty seeing how that fits centrally in the calling uh, to love God and how it fits the life of the mind. But that's not all there is to loving God. He says, in answer to the question, what's the most important thing? Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. We are not ideas machines. We are emotional beings, psychological beings, relational beings, physical beings. And God calls us to love him with all that we are and all that we have, and all that we do. We are much more complex than simply uh, ideas, generators and evaluators. And this picture, the picture of of the human person that, that, that is reflected in Jesus' teaching is actually something that's, that's being recognized. It has huge implications for how we think about everything else. Philosopher James K. Smith has lately been uh, recovering some of the ideas from Augustine and Aquinas that emphasize the fact that our desires, our motivational structures are deeply embedded in, in how we think and what we actually come to believe to be true. The ideas that actually make a difference in our lives are ideas that are deeply affected by all of these other aspects of our life, by our habits, by our disciplines, by our loyalties, by our character. And so I commend to you, brothers and sisters, not merely to think well about great books, not merely to think well about the greatest book, as as absolutely important as both of those things are but pull the periscope up all the way and recognize that God has created you to love him with all of that. And so engage, take advantage of the opportunities while you're here to engage in spiritual disciplines, to become formed in your character and your desires and your dispositions and your motivational structures, to become like Jesus. I've been rereading Dallas Willard lately. And he points out, we ask the question, what would Jesus do? But we very seldom ever realize that what Jesus actually did is fast, pray, study, uh, engage in acts of service, fellowship, and so on. He actually became the kind of person who was able to, to do what we usually think of when we think of what would Jesus do. The world will be a better place because you were here not just because you have been abstractly able to think well, although it will not be a better place if you don't, but as you become like Jesus and you begin to live the life vision that he casts in this incredible passage. Now, as promised, I wanna conclude with the other village. Around the same time that hundreds of thousands were being killed at Auschwitz, There was another small village in the mountains of southern France called Le Chambon. And in Le Chambon, about 5,000 people in this farming village saved about 5,000 to 6,000 Jews from the Holocaust, mostly children. In ethics, Le Chambon is almost as famous as Auschwitz. It's considered the greatest example of altruism, self-sacrificial love in the 20th century. These were not scholars, these were farmers. Except the pastor, Andre Trochme, who courageously led them, he would, he would certainly be qualified to be called a scholar, an intellectual. I doubt that many of them had read Homer or Hesiod, but they had read the Bible. They thought very well. And in the decades after World War II, scholars visited Le Chambon and they interviewed, they they questioned the people who rescued Jews. And they said, why did you do this at great cost to yourself, danger to yourself, uh, you know, threat of, of losing your own life? 
And the answers are just striking. In fact, there's a film that's on in the uh, Biola Library called Weapons of the Spirit that consists of interviews with these people. I would, I would strongly recommend it to you. But these people did not see themselves as heroic. They were kind of bashful. They were embarrassed to be asked why they did what they did. But their answers were, were shot through with a thoroughly biblical worldview. They said things like one person said, well, what else would we do? We're supposed to love our neighbors ourselves, and these were our neighbors. One person said, well, I didn't want to be like the priest and the Levite who walked on the other side of the road on the way to Jericho and the, when the guy had fallen among thieves, and these people had certainly fallen among thieves. The ideas that shaped the lives of those people were very different ideas than the ideas that shaped Nazism. Ideas about what is real, what is good, what's the most important thing in life. Ideas have consequences. What we believe will determine how we behave and ultimately who we become. And what we actually believe, believe will be shaped by our practices, by our desires. And so we need to take this seriously. I know I need to take this seriously. I need to take the rest of it besides just sitting and reading books seriously. And I commend that to you. And as you follow that form of life, the world will be a better place. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.